Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name, of course, is uh, Kaiser Sose, and uh, <laughs> I haven't felt this optimistic about life since the opening night screening of Turk 182. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw the Cliff Note gauntlet down right off the bat. There's just some nice seats there, huh? <laughs> like you're on that big rubber tire thing at the water slide, huh? <laughs> Spin it in the middle. <laughs> well, nice to be here at the uh, festival. I thank Max Yasger for lending us the farm. I, uh, <laughs> I've had a turbulent year personally. Went with the South winning the Toyotathon. And uh, it's nice to get here and unwind with friends. I, I don't ski much. Uh, not very good at it. I ski like a 42-year-old breadwinner. And uh, I look down the hill. I don't see a, a rewarding series of challenges, but rather a sterling opportunity for a radical decline in my wage earning ability. I, uh, <laughs> Don't want to end up one of these guys who goes head first into a tree and has to be renamed Slappy. And uh, <laughs> people have him over to their house for parties so they can shoot at his feet and make him dance. And uh, I've been such a prick in public for so many years. I'm sure there's a huge contingent of our culture that would absolutely revel in my Slappyosity. <laughs> Good Miller over here. Remember what a smart shit he was? Look at him, he's drooling. Bang! Yeah. <laughs> so, I was just up in my room watching Star Search, and uh, <laughs> folks, the country is officially out of talent. <laughs> uh, Returning comedy champion was Pueblo Commander Lloyd Booker, and uh, he was going down in flames. He just kept saying, I guess you had to be there. And uh, then I watched the movie Rudy, a rather uplifting film. Weird ending, though. He uh, shoots Oswald, and uh, I really didn't see it coming. I really didn't. I guess I should tell you a little bit about myself. I, uh, like most comedians, got my start in a skiffle band in Liverpool, the uh, Silver Millers, and I uh, was not a very adventurous child. I didn't do a lot of drugs when I was a kid, although it appeared to me that most kids in my high school trip more frequently than Rob Petrie. I uh, <laughs> still don't do a lot of drugs. I don't have anything specifically against them. It's just that I've discovered they're not nearly powerful enough to quell my exquisite inner pain. I, <laughs> I am packing more baggage than Joan Collins on safari. <laughs> I moved out of Los Angeles to Santa Barbara. I had trouble with LA because it was too much about show business. That led to a lot of vacuous thinking and insincerity. That's why many people look at LA and see it as half empty. Some see it as half full of it. I. Uh, <laughs> I had trouble being single when I was in Los Angeles, too, mainly because Billy Idol has fucked every woman in Los Angeles. <laughs> He's like a uh, sexual Ellis Island. When a, when a woman moves there, she has to check in with Billy, be processed and given a freak name. Uh, <laughs> although there's not a lack of women in Los Angeles, you go up to Roxbury on any weekend night, You'll see more little black dresses than the incredible Mishu's funeral. <laughs> I know Mishu's not dead, but I needed him for the joke. <laughs> and besides that, he's a midget and thus easily handled. <laughs> there are women in Los Angeles whose tits are so hard, superstitious people actually knock on them to reassure themselves. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Silicon. 
Who'd have thought the stuff you grout bathrooms with might be bad when injected into the human body, huh? <laughs> Garsh. They've been doing experiments on rats for years with silicon, and true, a lot of them did die of cancer, but they were getting asked out right up until the very end. And <laughs> you have to dig your own graves in this world. So I had Mexican for dinner, had the bean burrito, went right through me and lodged in Governor Conley's wrist. I also had the, uh, <laughs> so I had the free range chicken. Exactly how free was that range if this thing ended up on my plate, huh? <laughs> Thinking there was a fence somewhere on the perimeter of the free range. <laughs> Bottled water. Think this is any better or? I think it's just a clever marketing ploy, huh? Anybody else reading anything into the fact that Avion is naive spelt backwards? <laughs> it is, trust me, I looked. When I first came across that, when I first came across that, I thought, <laughs> no, that's too fucking perfect. <laughs> there's there's got to be an E somewhere in there. Hope you all had a nice Valentine's Day. I uh, got my wife the new Martha Stewart video, Don't Throw Out That Bow Movement. And uh, <laughs> she got me the Michael Jackson Home Facial Reconstruction Kit. <laughs> Mikey, time to stop tinkering with that noggin now. <laughs> this guy's starting to give Madame Tussaud the creeps. He's like the Golden Gate Bridge now. They just put a crew on year round, they get to the bottom of his feet, they start working on the top of his head again. <laughs> there goes my Jackson family honor. <laughs> Speaking of weird faces, see who came and went this week with her own TV talk show? Tammy Faye Baker. Yeah. Had a little piece of magic working there for five days with her co-host, Jim J. Bullock. <laughs> Jimmy came out last month and announced publicly that he was homosexual. Thanks for connecting those dots, Jimbo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Consider those tea leaves red, my friend. I couldn't have been any surer than that had the guy fucked me in the ass before I came on stage tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but Tammy Faye quit after only five days, so it was a little stressful. She didn't look good. Tammy looked beat. Uh, this woman has definitely lost a few heat towels on re-entry. <laughs> right, well, huh. anyway pass the hat and buy this broad a cloaking device or something. Another <laughs> rodeo clowns coming up to Tammy Faye Baker and saying, you know, baby, I got two words for you. Earth tones, all right? <laughs> you need me, I'll be in the barrel. <laughs> Jimmy, had no idea you were queer. <laughs> Tammy Faye Baker wears so much makeup now, they treat her like a Christmas tree. They don't even bother doing the third that faces into the wall. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I had run into the one pro Tammy Faye Baker crowd on the fucking planet. Thank you. <laughs> we'll usually follow you, Den, but we're taking a stand right there, goddammit. I was just down in Branson, Missouri, which is Tammy Faye Baker country. Branson is uh, Vegas for people without teeth. I, uh, <laughs> entire city is like a huge open air DMV office. <laughs> it's the sort of place where you'll see the club on a 73 AMC pacer. <laughs> That's a smooth move, Sherlock. I was gonna steal that because I need a new fucking aquarium for my koi fish. <laughs> I 
went to see the uh, <clears throat> Branson Philharmonic perform down there in the beautiful new concert hall on the interstate between Catfish Cabana and Unclaimed Freight. And uh, <laughs> they were doing the fifth movement of Tony Joe White's Poke Salad Annie. And <laughs> I tell you, when that washboard section stands to take its solo, I defy you not to tear up. <laughs> yeah. I always feel out of place in small towns like Branson. I'm uh, uncomfortable down south. I feel like Furman at the Apollo. I, uh... <laughs> you know, Branson's the sort of place where if they do run through with the Olympic torch, guys are going to try to light farts off it. And they'll pay to see anything down there. They're getting scalpers' prices for infomercial tickets. I got two on the floor for Juice Man. Who wants them? <laughs> it's nothing to do late at night down there. I mean, after you go to the Shoney's Salad Bar, which is the rural Stonehenge for that Druid Bako bit ceremony, and then, uh, you know, maybe once a year that <laughs> rotted teeth carnival rolls through town, you know, the. Cirque de Solieri, and then, uh, <laughs> other than that, you can go to the 24-hour Kinko's, which is like the Studio 54 of the 90s. You got Velvet Ropes out front, Steve Rubell, Ian Schrager. What's that? Reduce and colorize? Okay, bring it. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're in the Mike Todd room snorting mimeograph fluid off the small of RuPaul's back. <laughs> I, uh... Some of these images should be jarring. <laughs> All righty. Oh, fuck you. Get a climate. drier than Noel Coward up here. <laughs> I have trouble down south, but I do think that the south, small town America, gives you an accurate barometer of the pulse of this country. And right now, there is a pervasive anger out there in the hinterland. This country's about as skittish as Blanche Dubois in a 12-hour Sudafed. And, uh, <laughs> I personally find it as unsettling as a chauffeur in a neck brace. I think the... <laughs> I think the country is angry, and I think I can trace it back to the OJ case. Right now, I'd like to uh, articulate the white man's rage. Dag nabbit! <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not a racist myself. I always thought... Why well, hate somebody based solely on the color of their skin when if you just take the time to get to know them, there are so many more valid reasons to loathe an individual. Yeah. But I do think the OJ case was ground zero for the disintegration of race relations in this culture. The jury saw fit to see through blood evidence that to me was airtight. A no-brainer, seemed to make as much sense as opening a Ninja Turtle film in the Galapagos Islands, but they, uh, <laughs> they were able to cut through the haze, canny legal wizards that they were. <laughs> I don't think the jury system works anymore because I don't think everyday people are up to it. I don't think we're smart enough, really. I mean, they ask too much of juries. Beyond a reasonable doubt? What do you know beyond a reasonable doubt in your day-to-day -day life? How do you know you're still not tripping from that bad acid you took when you were 17 years old, huh? I mean, but I think lawyers are the main problem. The main reason justice is blind is, uh, oh. <laughs> the main reason justice is blind is because too many people like Johnny Cochran jerk off with it too frequently. This guy, 
This guy abused Lance Ito like he was a substitute teacher, all right? <laughs> I don't think the jury system has worked in a long time, and uh, I don't know. If you think about it, uh, the DeLorean jury? I mean, Jesus, they had videotape of this guy, dust buster in a steamer trunk, a Peruvian flake off a coffee table. He walks, I mean, what, what the fuck do you do? What, do you have to snort blow off the banister of the jury box, for Christ's sake? They, Lorena Bobbitt jury didn't know how to interpret the mere act of lopping your husband Schwantz off and <laughs> flinging it into the Okie Finoki. They felt they needed a little more data. Let's <laughs> put her away, observe her for a while. See if she does anything weird. So you put her in a state hospital for six weeks. At the beginning of her stay, you count up all the dicks. And uh, <laughs> a month and a half later, you do a little Johnson retally. <laughs> the skin flute vault is full. She walks. It's the American way, huh? <laughs> Proud to be on board. Give Johnny Cochran one thing. He's bright enough to see that the jury pool is comprised of the same people who actually moan when Woolery announces the date selections being put off till tomorrow's love connection, all right? <laughs> People who actually give a shit about the taster's choice couple. <laughs> now we have the Menendez trial. No doubt these two little jagoffs will skate, huh? Aren't you indignant that we live in a culture under a legal system where you can reload blow your mother's head off with a shotgun, and then upon advice of your legal counsel, get a neatly trimmed haircut and wear a cable knit sweater and actually have that matter in a court of law that is an insult to the intelligence of the living and a sacrilege against the memory of the dead. We have got far too many hung juries and not enough hung defendants. And you know something? I know why... And you know something, I know why we do this. We do this because it allows us to fancy ourselves as more evolved, more sensitive, more civilized than the perpetrators. And I think that's a dangerous deviation from one of the core tenets of human existence, which is self-preservation. Whether we like it or not, at some point in our personal evolution, we're going to have to concede the fact that pure and simply, there are some incredibly evil motherfuckers on this planet, and occasionally you have to thin the herd. You know, the... Uh, The liberals in this country are using their thumbs to cheat the scales of justice. And it gets more ridiculous every day. The ACLU now wants us to call the killer bees the manslaughter bees. Well, you know something? I don't think the ACLU has a fucking ACLUE, okay? I think they can... Uh... I think they can pride themselves on being in bed with the Timothy McVeighs of the world. But I think most of us see them for what they are, contrarian bullshit artists who think this misguided dedication to the evil doers of this planet somehow intellectually distances them from the rest of us, the bloodthirsty mob. Well, you know, I've got news for Ed Asner, Mr. Lou Grant Immunity and his ilk. The bad guys started it. When we kill somebody, we're just tidying up the campsite, all right? Tit for rat-a-tat-tat. It is time for the white hats to take back the planet. Plea bargaining? Do they hear the pleas of their victims? That fucking monster who killed that little girl in Petaluma, California should have been dead before he was able to pronounce the T sound at the end of I did it. And you know something? I don't... I don't care if he had a bad childhood. At least he got to live his out, didn't he? He's going to have a bad adulthood, too, because if we don't off him, we should put him in prison, and he should see hard, hard time for the rest of his life. I'm getting sick of hearing about prisoners who have a better basic cable package than I do. <laughs> you know, if you kill a kid or a cop, not only should they put you on death row, 
but they should charge you a security deposit on the cell, and then right before they throw the switch, they should tell you they've decided to keep it. <laughs> I think... Uh, And you know something, if kids kill, they've got to go away too, don't they? Let them make those little license plates for Spencer's gifts, all right? <laughs> Prison should be tough, folks. Now, unfortunately, it shouldn't be sodomy tough. That's what it's degenerated to in this country now. It's the first thing we think about when somebody gets sent up. Oh, that's got a sting. And, uh... <laughs> See, Pat Buchanan's now advocating a new position that we don't even sentence people to a certain amount of time anymore, but rather an amount of times they have to be fucked in the ass. And this way, <laughs> you want to get in there the first night and hold a big luau on the shower stall, you're out the next day, huh? How's that for leniency? <laughs> All right. Sodomy and Tammy Faye. Okay. Think prisoners are pissed off the nights we set the clocks back? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's got to be a tough day. Oh, sin. I should have. So you let me back in too easily. You dislike the sodomy bit. Don't applaud the next one. I, I have to be summarily chastised. I, uh,. Just love the thought of them in prison that night. Okay, lights out. Lights back on. Quit fucking with me, screw. <laughs> and you know something? While we become increasingly open-minded with prisoners, it seems we become increasingly closed-minded with each other. What we have right now, well, I'm not saying it's quite McCarthy-esque in this country, but certainly one can see Roy Cohn's shadow on the lawn. We have the gridlock of absolute freedom now. Everybody has a personal agenda. Everybody's a complete, unyielding pain in the ass about that agenda. It leads to a shrieking cacophony of heartfelt sentiment where everybody misassumes somehow that their slightest personal whimsy should translate to the law of the land. There's no more vivid depiction of this than the recent Supreme Court decision that made it illegal for anti-abortion people to use their bodies to block the entrance to abortion clinics. Naturally, the anti-abortion people are livid thinking of filing a countersuit against the court, and if they would just pause in their dementia for one second and see what they're saying by filing that suit, I think they'd see what they're saying is, who in the hell is the federal government to tell me what I can or cannot do with my body? And if I'm not mistaken... <laughs> you're like Frank in Blue Velvet, and you know... Let's face facts, folks. Nobody down here knows the answer to the cosmic riddle of abortion. And don't tell me your God tells you that abortion is wrong, because you know something? Your God is not everybody's God. That's why there were four solo Kiss albums to choose from, okay? <laughs> One man's Ace Freely is another man's Peter Chris. <laughs> Besides that, if abortion is wrong, <clears throat> why should we get in the middle of it? If it's wrong, God's going to kick your ass somewhere down the road. You're going to stroll up to those pearly gates. He's going to be standing there with those nunchuck sticks hanging around his neck. A little tattoo on his right arm, born to invent hell. You'll get the message. <laughs> what degree black belt do you think God is, huh? I just don't think we're smart enough down here to know if abortion is right or wrong. I know we fancy ourselves as the master thief species of the universe, but if you pause and think about it. This is really just an ant farm with beepers. I mean, take a look. <laughs> take a look at the person next to you. Tell me if you think they've figured out abortion. Take a good look at them. <laughs> you can't believe what they were out of the house tonight. <laughs> so when did it all go wrong? When did this country and the specific and the world in general go off the tracks? Well, I remember thinking the world was in trouble when I first heard they had opened a Derwiner schnitzel at Machu Picchu. And uh, <laughs> as far as this country goes, I think I knew we were first in trouble when I actually saw 
Tanya Harding's fat fuck, semi-retarded bodyguard being interviewed on network television. I thought, for Christ's sake, we are face down in the gutter now. What, what sort of pin the tail on the zygote genetic crapshoot was that, huh? This, this guy was the mask of Nefertiti for bottom feeders. I mean, somebody was definitely playing double dutch with that DNA strand. Did this kid not realize he was going to be suspect number one when the shit hit the fan? Who do you think in a Harding camp might have been responsible for this? You think it's that huge inbred jab of the hut motherfucker over there? The <laughs> kid with a diaphanous chromosome stack who last got laid when Mazeroski hit his homer? You think, uh, <laughs> think he had anything to do with it? Says he had an alibi, Sarge. Says he was dragging himself up from the primordial morass that afternoon. and learning to stand erect. <laughs> what are these people doing on television? Why do we let them on? This is a Skinner box. We have to give them the electric shock, not the corn kernel. Why is this culture so quick to exalt the banal and so begrudging of the truly consequential? Did you watch these daytime talk shows? Did you ever watch these things? I look at him, I feel like Phil Collins watching Ann Ranking sing Against All Odds at the Oscars, you know? It's like, <laughs> what are you doing to my song, for Christ's sake? So painfully bad, you have to ask for an epidural halfway through it. The other day, I'm watching Jerry Springer, which is like Thunderdome for chiclet brains. <laughs> He's got this cult of promiscuous necrophiliacs on who fuck anything that doesn't move. And then uh, I go over to Montel Williams, which is ring two on the anomaly circus. He's got a sarcastic agoraphobic chick on for an hour, just sitting there going, haven't been there, haven't done that. So I flip it over to, uh, <laughs> flip it over to Jenny Jones. She's got Gene Dixon on, the National Enquirer's 800-year-old psychic. And excuse me, but this woman doesn't look like she can see the top line on the eye chart, much less the future, all right? And if she can, she can obviously see far enough ahead to a time when that hairstyle is going to be back in fashion. Like Mrs. Drysdale, an electrolyte shock or something. Folks, the inmates are subletting the asylum. This country has turned into one big, violent trailer park. Everybody is pissed off, high, and armed. And is it the best country on the planet Earth still? Yeah, probably is, but isn't that sort of like being valedictorian in summer school? I mean... Every second guy I bump into is an emotional Krakatoa ninja wannabe who thinks he's fulfilling a Nostradamus prophecy by taking out the entire pharmaceutical department at the local Save-On, sitting down in his basement using heavy hands, watching Enter the Dragon on a perpetual loop, bracing himself for the holy battle to come. Well, you know, I'm telling you something. I've never said this in public before, but I'm 42 years old, and... Uh, I think it might be unfixable. I never thought that before, but I look at the world around me and I think, uh, geez, I don't even know if I want to try to fix it anymore. Maybe it's time to make a little bread, build a wall, take care of my loved ones, do a little charitable work to keep my karma level and stay out of the crosshairs of the scope because it is a fucking madhouse out there. <laughs> you ever see the look on anybody's face who's over 80 years old? They give you that good fucking luck look. Or like the last guys to get off the embassy roof in Saigon, you know. <laughs> and I didn't always feel this way. When I was in my 20s, I was very idealistic. But quite frankly, you can afford to be. You've got all the time in the world. Time moves very slowly, like you're perpetually putting in that last 12 cents worth of gas at the self-serve pump. <laughs> then in your 30s, you become a bit more pragmatic. If a tree falls in the woods and I'm not there to hear it, you know, who gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> 
And then in your 40s, you become a realist because you realize time is clicking by. And right now, I feel like Rod Taylor sitting outside that dress shop in a time machine. I realize a scant 30 years from now, my prostate's going to be a jujube. And uh, I don't have time to tilt at the crack windmills anymore, all right? When I was 10 years old, we had an above ground pool in the backyard of my house. I used to run the perimeter of that pool for 30 minutes at a time to get that current going. And believe me, I was always the first little kid to turn, take it on my chest, and fight the current. I'm getting a little too old now, though. I don't want to fight the current anymore. I just want to fall back into it, occasionally brush my dick up against the warm water intake pipe, all right? <laughs> That's all I'm looking for. I have a wife I adore on a daily basis. I can't believe she married me. I thank God. I have two sons that I, I live for. My youngest son, Marlon, his older, more dependable brother, Patches. And uh, I took them shopping today. I bought my one son a Jurassic Park action figure. Got him the thesaurus. This is a tiny creature who often used flowery language to extricate himself from potentially life-threatening situations. <laughs> Hey, you up there, your massive jaws are vainglorious. <laughs> I was reading an article in USA Today that said children from single-parent homes have much better verbal skills than kids from two-parent homes, but kids from two-parent homes are far superior at bitterly sarcastic repartee. <laughs> kind of a... Uh... I've been traveling with my sons. We were just at Disneyland. We're on It's a Small World. I ran into a guy I hadn't seen since the fourth grade. And uh, <laughs> just, just trolling there. That's uh, <laughs> it's not a hard bonefish strike. Just a little premise runs through it thing. And then I took them to uh, the Universal City Studio Tour. They have an earthquake ride there that vividly recreates an earthquake measuring 7.2 on the Richter scale. I remember thinking to myself, imagine a poor bastard tourist who is actually on this ride at the precise moment the actual earthquake does hit. Whoa, Marcy, this is so real. Look at that beam coming at us. No, 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 whack, you know. Excuse me, tram driver. My old man's been decapitated. Is that part of it? <laughs> yeah. Want to kick back a couple beans on that admission? Uh, caught me a corn dog up here at the pleasure kiosk. Okay, fuck me. Super ride. Thank you. <laughs> Is that the Amblin building? I. Uh... Is there a more useless job on the face of the planet Earth than earthquake scientist? I mean, what demands do we put on these people? You got five stoners sitting up in the foothills with peyote buttons and a Ouija board, you know. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe. Wait, wait, you feel that? You feel it? <laughs> no, no, nothing, nothing. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, m maybe tomorrow. <laughs> maybe on payday. Why is the spokesperson at the Caltech Seismological Institute always a lesbian? What is that, uh, a mandatory hiring practice or something? I find it ironic the entire place is staffed by women who have never felt the earth move. I, uh... <laughs> I know there's some pissed off lesbian in the crowd now. Hey, motherfucker, I've been brought off by a woman. Yeah, so have I. They're great. It was a joke, all right? It was a joke. Yeah. I think so little of the variations in human sexuality that I refuse to treat homosexuals like Fabergé eggs. You're part of the human collective. You too can be poked fun at. Come, join in our reindeer games, all right? <laughs> the only people I don't tease are people who are defective, Homosexuals are obviously not broken in any way, shape, or form. But conversely, on the other end of the scale, I don't owe them my approval. What I owe them is what I owe any of you, my complete and utter indifference. There is nothing more fascinating to me on the face of the planet Earth than my orgasm, and nothing less fascinating to me 
than your orgasm, all right? I don't... I don't care if you have to strap a duck-billed platypus on your crotch to get off. You go right ahead. Just don't ask me to borrow my platypus, all right? I don't quibble with anybody's sexuality, except, of course, maybe bisexuals, because... You know, I think we'll all agree at some point these people are just incredibly greedy motherfuckers. I, uh, I don't ask much from a human being, but come down off the fence and pick a hole, all right? I, uh, I, don't, I don't care what you fuck, but fuck it regularly. Dance with the orifice that brung you. What is with this sexual, intrusive thing we've got in this country now? Is it not the height of narcissism? I mean, when you think about what an amazingly intricate, idiosyncratic set of Rube Goldbergian synapses has to occur for a human being to get off in the first place, what a fragile house of pornographic playing cards human sexuality is, to legislate it on somebody else is just amazing to me. I want you to take a pause for a second and think about the weirdest thing you've ever done as a heterosexual to get off. You know, that one that haunts you. <laughs> Lock that little postcard into your head, you know. Guys masturbating to the price is right. Men actually do this. 10, 15 in the morning, laying on the sofa, pans down around her ankles, thinking, travel showcase, travel showcase, travel showcase, travel showcase. Oh, shit, Holly in the train again? It's three times this week. This show is shit since Diane split. <laughs> Ladies, if your man is not physically in your presence at any given moment, he's masturbating. This is what we do. It's our raison wankra. <laughs> I used to masturbate before I knew what the word meant. Standing there in the playground in seventh grade, you want to look left out, you're trying to act cool. Yeah, yeah, masturbation, yeah. Love it. Yeah, big fan, sure. Killer. All right, I got to go now, guys. I lucked into this freaky little thing I do to my own penis. But uh, <laughs> you guys keep masturbating, all right? I've masturbated while looking directly into an eclipse and using a set of clackers with my offhand, all right? <laughs> and it's never going to change. You can come back to this planet a thousand years from now. Man might have evolved to the point where he doesn't even ingest food through a hole in his head for nutrition. I guarantee you, he's still going to be smacking the flesh ketchup bottle, all right? <laughs> because men are orgasm junkies, and we are from age 12 on. That's when it first happens, I guess. You're watching that Lucy episode where she wrestles the chick in the wine vat and uh, you know you've been watching it for years and all you ever thought was oh god Lucy Ricky is gonna be so mad at you and then one day you're watching it and you're thinking yeah go ahead Lucy <laughs> mash a little Beaujolais into that gypsy areola you magnificent rouge warrior you Because the orgasm never disappoints, does it, huh? You've never come and thought, ooh, shit, what was that? It's, uh, <laughs> it's always there for you. As a matter of fact, the orgasm doesn't have to feel half as good as it does to still place in the top five on Casey's thrill chart. And uh, that's what I admire about the little guy. He'll go the extra yard for you. So as far as human sexuality goes, I guess what I'm saying is it's about time we all learn to keep our noses out of where other people choose to keep their noses. There are no taboos between consenting se adults sexually. There's only one great taboo in the world of sex, and that's obviously child abuse. I think it augurs for the end of the world. You've got to promise me if you're in this room tonight or watching at home on television, and you ever get to the point in your life where you're so puzzled, confused, frightened, or broken that you feel you're only out as the fuck or murder a little kid, well, you've got to kill yourself. <laughs> You have got to, uh... You have got to lean into the strike zone and take one for the team. <laughs> Trust me, there'll be major rewards paid when you bump into the big guy on the other side of the curtain. You know, God, I was gonna do that kid, but instead I put my brains on the wall. Did you? 
Get over here, you little mensch. Some Yahweh noogies. You sit with me. You want the clicker? Go ahead. Knock yourself out. No, turn that preacher show off. Put, uh, put E on. Let's see what Kometko's new sweater looks like. <laughs> so what else is up? I've been traveling. I was just in Europe. I was over in uh, Paris for that uh, Ted McGinley retrospective at the Sorbonne. And uh, <laughs> I enjoy my time in Paris. I have trouble with men, French men taking them seriously. They're always wearing the beret. I feel like I'm talking to Vance, the muskrat from Deputy Dog. Staying in Paris in a tough, tough neighborhood on a little street called Rue the Day. And I should tell you, <laughs> well, I enjoyed my time in France. The French hate our fucking guts. I cannot believe they actually gave us the Statue of Liberty. They must have been throwing it out anyway. Or <laughs> maybe we picked it up at a huge monument garage sale. My wife and I held a garage sale last month, and I was half tempted to charge one pubic hair for something, just so I could actually hear another human being say, will you take a half a pubic hair for that? <laughs> I went directly from uh, Paris to Las Vegas, which I believe is the cultural equivalent of a groin pool. I, uh, <laughs> straddling the multicultural harbor like Laurie Singer between two pickup trucks, I was, uh, I went into Vegas for the Riddick Bowe Five-ish Finkel heavyweight title fight and uh, got stuck in a bad hotel. I'm usually at the Desert Inn, but I was in a really bad hotel, the sort of hotel where you see Barton Fink storming out of the lobby in a huff. You know, the maids come around in the early evening and give each guest one sock off the common mint. I went from, directly from Las Vegas to uh, Aspen via Denver. I flew up to Denver on Southwest Air. I, not a bad flight. I had an oar right near the drum, and uh, <laughs> I think it's nice they put those changing tables in the men's rooms at the Denver airports. Now it gives the, gives the guys a place to arm wrestle in between flights, huh? <laughs> Boy, this is a tough place to fly into for a bad flyer. I'm a very bad flyer. I, I always assume that the plane's secure position in the air is entirely predicated on the degree of rigidity that I hold in my own body. I uh, <laughs> notice there are a lot of qualifications to sit next to that exit door now on the plane, huh? <laughs> what am I, fucking MacGyver or what? <laughs> you know, that's my first impulse if I do survive the wreck. I'm going back in to get the guy in 13C who wouldn't quit picking his nose throughout the flight, you know. Yeah, I can't believe I'm back here either. Come with me. Other hand. Other hand! <laughs> if you ever get on a plane and see me sitting next to the exit door, I've lied to the stewardess. I've told her I'm going to help out. I'm not. <laughs> you're going to look over at me, you're going to see a roadrunner cloud heading off into the distance, all right? And you know something? I expect the same thing out of you. You don't owe me your life. A computer just put us together. We're not the defiant ones, okay? But the best you can expect out of me is I might allow you to draft me as we move rapidly away from the plane, all right? <laughs> you tuck right in here like Earnhardt at Talladega. Maybe I'll get you out of there, all right? So, what else is up in the world? You happy with your president? <laughs> wow, hullabaloo. No, do you like Bill Clinton? Yeah, this is a pretty liberal state. Really, that's the most people in months that have said they like Clinton. I, I don't think the country, by and large, likes him, and I don't understand that, really, because uh, we probably should like him more. I know I don't like him at all, and I was thinking, God, why is that? I mean, he's the first president of my generation. I'm almost as old as this guy, although that probably works against him because I... I know how completely full of shit I am, and uh, I assume that he's in somewhat the same concentric circle on the malarkey dartboard as me. But really, when you consider him in a bloodless manner, he's not a bad, uh, not a bad president, certainly charismatic, kind of good-looking guy, uh, seems to be a good father, nice self-deprecating sense of humor, certainly the most intelligent president that we've seen in our adult lifetimes, and 
I, therein lies the rub, Watson. I think the reason that Bill Clinton is disliked by most Americans is because we realize he's entirely smart enough to know how completely full of shit he is with us. <laughs> Say what you will about Ronald Reagan, and certainly towards the end of that second term, he had that glazed over Pirates of the Caribbean thing happening. <laughs> but you knew when Reagan's head hit the pillow at night, at least he believed his own bullshit. I don't think Clinton's head can hit the pillow until he studies the three by five card left there by Stephanopoulos detailing to him what tomorrow's bullshit will be. George Stephanopoulos has done more for spin in this country than anybody since Enrico Fermi. This guy is a dreidel and a pair of size five and a half black wingtips. And I think he and Bill have to get their connection right. I think that if they really want to be taken to the bosom of the American people, they're going to have to understand that we don't care about a lot of the things they care about. I think the chasm between Bill Clinton's potential and Bill Clinton's actuality is so vast that as he awkwardly attempts to straddle it, his day-to-day -day struggle tends to set off his deficiencies in much the same way that black velvet jeweler's cloth will show the flaws in a low-grade diamond. Bill Clinton's is a cubic zirconium presidency, and I think he misreads the American people. I think he thinks we care about his foibles and his peccadilloes. And you know, at the end of the day, I don't believe we do. If he and his wife don't have sex, and he has sex with every other woman on the planet, I don't think at the end of the day we really care. As far as an illegal land deal in Arkansas goes, I mean... <laughs> Fuck it, it's Arkansas. What, what, what is... What does that mean to me out here in the real world under the yellow sun, huh? How badly can you break the law in Arkansas? What, do you have some inside trading information on the Star Trek commemorative plate market? Uh, there's a new Ahura pressing coming out next Tuesday. Call Gecko. Dump out now! Jimmy, Jimmy, use Vesco's offshore account, okay? <laughs> so I don't think we care about any of that. I think what we do care about is the weapons-grade bullshit, the Phil Spector wall of sound approach to denial. And at some point, if this man really wants to be taken to the bosom of the American people, he's going to have to drop the artifice, the pretense, the smoke and mirror, the obfuscation, look us in the eye like a big boy and say, yeah, I inhaled it, then I drank the fucking bong water. What are you going to do about it, all right? I mean... I want a president who got high. I want somebody who rooted their psychic pipes out with a little microdot somewhere along the way, okay? It's such a stressful job. I hope he still gets high. I'd love to see him stumble into a press conference one day and say, you know, Hillary and I did up a tie stick in the Lincoln bedroom last night. It blew my fucking skull off, all right? I mean... Even Al Gore admits he and his wife used to get high, and she's so uptight, she walks with her legs crossed. I mean, <laughs> I think that's how she got the nickname, sitting there rolling a big fat one. Somebody had to put that last big wet twist on it. Give it to the tipper! <laughs> Woo! Come and get it! Fuck tipper, I love you, baby. I'm gonna marry you, girl. <laughs> We're gonna be vice president! Shut off, Al. You're way too fucked up. <laughs> you know what I do feel bad for Clinton is when he has to meet with veterans groups. Always feels a little awkward, doesn't it? He knows, too. He's got that look on his face like the kid who brought Sam G and Connor's daughter home late from the prom. You know, he's on. <laughs> Well, that was a scare, scary era. Maybe that's one I'll forgive Bill Clinton for because I grew up in that era. I was in the Grand Guignol Lottery of Death. I uh, drew 362. Quite frankly, Charlie had to be at the St. Louis Arch for me to see action. But uh, <laughs> having said that, I don't think I could have gone because uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a complete pussy. I, uh, <laughs> when I was a junior in high school, I went to work at H Salt Fish and Chips to get money for the junior prom. I quit after two days because when I would throw the cod fillets into the bubbling hot oil, it would splash my arm and it hurt. It hurt a lot. <laughs> You're going to airdrop me into a rainforest to do hand-to-hand -hand with Jackie Chan? Are you shitting me? <laughs> Come on. Uh, uh. 
Is that poison ivy? Move over here. <laughs> oh, well. I'm not sure the presidency even works anymore. I'm advocating a new system, the volleyballtocracy. You elect six men. One of them serves till he fucks up. You rotate. Somebody else takes it for a while. I, uh... I was a Ross Perot man, still am. I like Perot for the exact same reason everybody else hates him. He's more fucked up than Peter O'Toole on his birthday. This guy. <laughs> this is a crazy little bastard. And four years down the road, how crazy is he now after he's been stewing in that own pre-psychotic crock pot for the last four years? He is ready to emerge like Goldblum from the fly chamber and tango. Ross Perot is a forehead vein in a gray suit. And you know something? <laughs> I know he's rough around the edges, but I guarantee you, if he'd gotten elected, he would have gotten in there and through mere naivete of the corrupt political system that exists at the core of life in Washington, D.C., you know he would have clumsily stumbled around and inadvertently thrown a clig light on what has become an incestuous little pool of self-interest. Washington, D.C. politicians don't give a shit about you and I, and we give them far too wide a berth. We should be in their face like Cagney with a grapefruit half. We should be on them like Lecter on Migs. They are a bunch of tired, old, white men, unimaginative. They are the town elders from Footloose, and it's time that we... It's... It is time for us to put them out of the temple. Al D'Amato, shut up and sit the fuck down, all right? You know... Having Al D'Amato chair an ethics committee is like having Dr. Kevorkian teach you the Heimlich maneuver. Bob Packwood, I find it ironic that a man who is ostensibly pro-choice might find it so hard to believe that a woman might choose not to be groped by him. And now he leaves the Senate and it's all over? I made my bed, now I'll lie about it? I don't think so, Bob. We're coming to get you. And the right thing has to be done, my friend. You have to be made a Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Now we have Newt Gingrich, this is my favorite, people who live in crass houses. This guy's parents give him the worst name in the history of the planet. Let's name our kid after the, the centaur on the Hercules cartoon. Let's send him off to have his ass kicked for the next 12 years. Now he's taking it out on us for the rest of his life. Well, I'll tell you one thing about Ross Perot. The first day some asshole like Newt Gingrich walked in and said, Ross, I'd like to vote with you on that crime bill, but I'm going to need you to throw me a bone. I need a water treatment plan in my home district or I can't give you my vote. Perot would have been on Larry King that night screaming, guess who called me today and threatened you? That little motherfucker Gingrich! Release the Kraken! We're gonna shave that pansy's ball sack, sit him down in a bucket of witch hazel. And then... And people say, come on, do you want Perot with his finger on the button? Do you think the Joint Chiefs of Staff were ever going to actually let Ross Perot near the real button? <laughs> Do you not know they would have rigged up a little stunt button for him? And if he ever pressed it, it would have squirted him in the face with lemonade? <laughs> and the great thing about Perot is he would have laughed the hardest at that. That's not the real button, is it? Good for you, boy. I'm a crazy motherfucker. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.
looks like fun to me. <laughs> There's a little bit of a problem here, but you stabilize. You drive home, everything's great, huh? Now this sign will slow you down, all right? <laughs> this sign will slow you down. <laughs>